let's get started. So again, my name is uh, Deborah Trusty. I am a lecturer at the University of Iowa and also um, the president of the AIA Iowa Society. Um, I am joined today by Alba Maza. Dr. Maza is a senior archeologist um, with the um, US Defense um, POW and MIA Accounting Agency um, with the Henry M. Jackson Foundation. Um, and a little bit about Dr. Maza. Uh, Alba Maza is an underwater archeologist with more than 18 years of field work and experience in the Mediterranean. She obtained her PhD in 2017 from the University of Sydney, Australia. Um, and her research focuses on submerged settlements and human environment interactions in the coastal zone. Her work also focuses on prehistoric seafaring and commercial navigation during the classical antiquity in Sicily, Italy. Um, and additionally, Dr. Maza is the AIA McCann Taggart Lecturer for 2021-2022. And so let me speak a little bit about what this lectureship is. This endowed lectureship was established in 1985 by Robert D. Taggart um, in honor of his wife's contributions to the field of underwater archaeology. Anna Marguerite McCann was a pioneering underwater archaeologist with a specialty in ancient harbors and the new robotic technology used in underwater research. Her publication, The Roman Port and Fishery of Cosa, a Center of Ancient Trade, was awarded the James R. Wiseman Book Award of the Archaeological Institute of America in 1989. And so the McCain, uh, McCann Taggart uh, lecturer is chosen by the Underwater Archaeology Interest Group and annually lectures to three local societies. We are one of those lucky societies. And so I will now turn this over to Dr. Maza, who will take it all away. Go ahead. So thank you. Thank you, Deborah. And hello, everyone. Uh, before I get started, I would like to thank the Archaeological Institute of America for this extraordinary opportunity. Being nominated as a McCann Taggart Lecturer in Underwater Archaeology is an honor for me. I feel humbled and excited to be part of such a prestigious institution and group of scholars who since 1985, when the endowment was created, are committed to present the latest discoveries in the field of underwater archaeology, as well as the results of decades of passionate and collaborative research. I would also like to thank the Iowa Society and especially Professor Deborah Trusty for a warm welcome and introduction. Thank you. And thank you everybody for being here today. I know, you know, I, I hope to, that this could have been a, an in-person meeting, but uh, a Zoom lecture is also very nice and many people from different parts of the United States can join. So thank you everybody for your time and I'm glad to, to see so many people here today. I was very fortunate in my career as an underwater archeologist. I work with a very, a very diverse group of scholars and researchers from different fields and from different parts of the world. My interdisciplinary approach towards the study of ancient cultures and their maritime connection allowed me to collaborate with archaeologists, geoscientists, and historians, and many more. One of the scholars that I'm most grateful to is Professor Sebastiano Tusa, an underwater archaeologist, head of the Soprintendenza del Mare in Sicily, Italy, who unfortunately passed away in, 19, uh, in 2019. In today's presentation, titled Lost Landscape of Sicily, Italy, Submerged cities and ancient shorelines from prehistory to the Roman world. I aim to illustrate the great variety of Sicilian maritime landscape with a focus on the human interaction with the natural environment over a long period of time. And now that I read the title of this presentation with you guys, I understand that it's a very ambitious subject to cover in less than one hour but I hope that this summary will provide you with the sufficient information to be interested in the topic and you know, knowing more about this very interesting subject. And I will do so by presenting case studies from different times period and from different coastal settlements in Sicily. 
The cultural heritage of Sicily, the largest island of the Mediterranean Sea, is incredibly vast. From Paleolithic engraves and paintings in caves, such as the one from the island of Levenso, which I hope you can see my, the mouse moving. This, the, this is one of the most beautiful evidence of uh, engravings in Sicily. To other type of evidence, such as Bronze Age rock cutting tombs from Tapsus here on the top, as well as Phoenician, Greeks, and Roman evidence. We have a sample in this slide from the great variety consisting, for example, in the, uh, the temple, the theater in Termina, or from the, um, the temple in Agrigento, or from the Piazza Marina uh, mosaics, and as well as these at the very right, the charioteer from Mozia, very well known uh, coastal settlement in uh, Western Sicily. The underwater archaeological findings, some of which I collected in this slide, tell us a story of a millenarian cultural interaction. Shipwrecks, especially, have brought us some of the finest Greek and Roman sculptures, along with knowledge of complex commercial networks, as well as maritime rituals and even military tactics. In this slide, I'm just collecting a few photographs that I want to briefly describe with you. So we have the very well-known uh, dancing sapphire from Mazzara del Vallo, and also beautiful ram, uh, bronze ram from the Egeri battle um, in, um, in Western Sicily. And also this collection of uh, pyra pyramid of amphors, uh, Dressel 1A from the Lipari Archaeological Museum, which by the way collects one of the largest underwater archaeological collection in the entire Europe. And then this is a beautiful head of philosopher from the Porticello shipwreck in the Messina Strait, the very well-known um, statuette of uh, Reshef, a Phoenician deity that was found offshore Salinos and has been currently dated to the 13th century BC. And this photograph is a very recent discovery from the Superintendenza del Mare three, four years ago. Those are uh, Oricalcum Aingo, it's, um, it's an Aldoi, uh, and together with beautiful bronze helmet. And to the very right, this is a, an amazing Lotharion, a terracotta clay Lotharion, which has been found in, uh, uh, in 2013, offshore the coast of Panorea in the Olean Islands. And I'm very happy that I was part of this, the research team who investigated and is now published in this book which is uh, uh, a collection of articles from um, a conference held in Melbourne, Australia, back in 2012, I, guess, I think. And this book is edited by Gillian Shepherd and um, from the La Trobe University the Trendel Center, and is titled Interaction and Identity, Sicily and South Italy from the Iron Age to the Late Antiquity, has just been pu published like uh, a few months ago, very, very, very interesting collection of uh, most recent work in the Mediterranean and especially Southern Italy and Sicily. But going back to my, the topic of my presentation, today I would like to explore with you a relatively less investigated topic in the field of underwater archaeology and especially in the field of Sicilian archaeology, which is the coastal landscape. The coast is a physical and liminal place where people meet, pray, trade, socialize, make connections and cre create identities. In the past, this liminal zone featured special, specific cultural connotations and was the boundary between life represented by the land and death represented by the sea. Many scholars, such as Ina Berg, for example, Cooney or Ford, I agree that the coast was in fact a natural boundary of the landscape, infused with speech, spiritual connotation, often related to the nature of the sea, which is both benevolent and positive, or negative and dangerous. Most of the negative aspects of the sea are related to the consideration that the sea itself was a place of no return, a disappearing place, an away place as clearly demonstrated by the study of classic authors and literary sources. Ships, by crossing this dangerous substance, 
might themselves be associated with death. In fact, both in many cultures are metaphor for, of the travel for, to the underworld, are often part of mortuary rituals. Nevertheless, for the people living on the coast, the sea and the shore itself were considered a familiar landscape. And I'm just collecting in this slide a few broad examples of Sicilian coastal landscape and how people interact in different parts of Sicily and different times. For example, this is um, um, an ink painting, I think, from the beginning of the 19th century of Palermo. And this is just a very a, a today's photograph of fishermen um, walking on the, on, the, on the shoreline of one of Sicilian harbors. Top right, you can see um, a watercolor painting from Gore, which is a who is a, a traveler who travel in the with as, as a part of the Grand Tour travelers, and then um, he was especially focusing on depicting ancient ruins close to the shoreline and close to the landscape. Sorry. And bottom right here, we have one of the most iconic representation of today's cultural interaction and connection on the shore, actually is on the sea, just a representation of a, a procession, a ritual procession of two saints, of the statues of two saints, St. Joseph and St. Mary, brought in procession on a, on, a, on a boat. And this image here is the very well-known image from Ina Berg, which represents maritime lives on a Greek vessel. So when, um, sorry, um, and going back to my notes, it's not uncommon to find archeological evidence of such a relationship in coastal sanctuaries, such as Selinunte, for example, which was a topic of my PhD research. Today, I don't include Selinunte in my presentation because it was a very large topic, but um, I just want to let you know that if you're interested to know more, I just published an article in the journal Open Archaeology um, four months ago, and you can find the latest information of my research in that article, and I'm happy to share that with you if you're interested um, as soon as we, we, we finish uh, this lecture today. So in Silinunte, for example, there are examples of this uh, interaction, I guess. For example, for the sanctuary of Zeus Malikis on the Gajurail, where several anchor stocks were found in fixing the terrain, most likely used as a stelae, and those were real anchors, real anchor functional anchors. Parallels can be found in coastal Greece, as well as in southern Italy, and other coastal settlements of southern Italy, such as Metaponto, Locri, Croton. And this is, of course, just one of the main examples of such relationship. And if you're interested, the century of Zeus Malikius has been taken in the 6th, 5th century BC. So the coast, which is such a distinct boundary between the land and sea, is, however, one of the most complex and ever-changing features of our planet. The coast, in fact, is constantly moving and changing shape. And I'm sure everybody of you uh, experienced it in your life, for example, daily tidal movements, as well as seasonal changes, which are two of the most immediately variation anyone can experience in a relatively short period of time. However, other types of changes also exist, such as tectonic uplift, submergence, subsidence, erosion, sedimentation, and I'm showing this map of Sicily just to show you that Sicily, on top of that, is one of the most complex geological and geomorphological regions in the Mediterranean. The island features the tallest active volcano in Europe, which is Mount Etna, as well as other active volcanoes in the Aeolian Islands. There are several active faults, and I'm just showing you one year. There is one year which has been discovered very recently, which might be one of the causes for the um, recurrent earthquakes in the area of Salinas, which is located here. And other very diverse features, geology, geomorphology of Sicily. For example, Sicily itself is moving as an island towards the north as part of the movements of the African and the Eurasian plateau. Of course, sub-regional movements are also present. Well, one of the most significant results of this movement, which is related to our investigation of the coastal today, of the coastal landscape, is the over, is the over time change 
of the shoreline position. As scientists are currently use the term paleo shoreline to describe the, local, the location of the shoreline antiquity. And of course, this is not a geological and geomorphological lecture, but I thought I, just giving you this overview might, might be able to help you understand the great variety of the different coastal landscape that I will shortly describe. And I just want to start with very quick examples, one from the town of Palermo and one from the town of Calania at the right. For Palermo, for example, here we have the main city and on the north and on the south, two main rivers. And this was, was the, um, um, the, the, the topography of the city in antiquity. However, nowadays, and you can see this is like a big arbor basin and the two rivers flowing in the arbor basin. Nowadays, however, it's totally different. As you know, Palermo is currently inhabited, has been inhabited for continuously for several millennia right now. And the, and the coast itself is heavily urbanized. So this is the current shape of, the, of today's shoreline. And there is a major subst substantial difference. So when we think about Phoenician, Rome, Greek, Roman people living, we have to completely change our approach on how they experience the sea and how they experience the water. And it is very intuitive now to better and to understand that the name of the city in, in the past, Palermo, from the Greek panormos, which means the city with a huge, large harbor, harbor basin, is more likely connected to the ancient topography of the city. Much, much, makes much more sense to think that this was an ancient arbor basin. And to jump into Catania, a completely different example. As you know, Catania is very close to the volcano Etna, which has been erupting uh, lava for several centuries now. And as you can see, this red portion of this image here indicates some of the most current lava eruption which arrived close to the shoreline and in fact create additional shore. I don't know if you have experience visiting Catania. I strongly recommend it. It's a beautiful city, great food. But um, if you go on to if you approach the shoreline, you see that it's all massive black lava mm, floating in the ocean and you can see crystallized and therefore, if we apply this to the uh, topography of ancient Catania in the past, we can see that the Acropolis, for example, was most likely once located very close to the shore. And now there are several hundreds of meters of land which was created over time the, because of the eruption of Vulcano. But let's start with our uh, tour of Sicily today. And um, I just want to start, I, I'm going to do a diachronic chronological um, description, and I would like to start with something which is dated very early in time to the place to see. And the, the topic I would like to briefly discuss today is a site called uh, Torretta Granitola, which is located, it's a very small coastal, set, coastal site nowadays, located in the, the Mazzara del Vallo area. So, it is hard to believe that the landscape that now we have in Sicily today, long time ago was really completely dramatically different. For example, this is a, a diachronic map on how the landscape of Sicily, sorry, the, the topography of Sicily would have looked like over time from the early place to scene where this is the, the gray indicates the only emerged land and this, indicated all the submerged land. So over time, the emerged land become much bigger and more or less featuring what we see today. However, in the late glacial maximum, which is around 20,000 BC, the, the topography of Sicily completely changed again. And now we have that Sicily and Malta were connected by a land bridge and um, Sicily was much closer to Tunisia than it is nowadays. However, the topic of uh, the, the specific item I would like to discuss today is this unique feature, which has been found underwater around the 15 meters of depth. And I hope you can see better in, a, in, this, in this slide here. So this is an amazing discovery of an underwater elephant tusk. 
daily to the back to the place to sing. Was found accidentally by a fisherman and then the Superintendent del Mare did several years of archaeological investigation and found that the task uh, was connected, was anatomically connected to other evidence, including a portion of cranium, uh, tooth, other bones. And uh, we, the research continued and the, the evidence indicated that these uh, these bones um, uh, are related to a specific type of elephants that lived in Sicily a long time ago. The name of these elephants is Elephas menandriensis and is um, a dwarf elephant, a, very, a small one. And you can see compared to the, um, to the, to the, to the height of a, of a person is much smaller. And uh, I found this extremely fascinating and interesting because thanks to this underwater discovery, we know more about this specific uh, environment that was in Sicily long ago. And especially, I just would also would like to um, give you a, a little bit of insight of uh, something that might be considered very interesting. So um, you, uh, bone evidence, bones evidence from elephants were found in Sicily from terrestrial site. This is the first time they would be found underwater. But in the past, when people found this, this the cranium, the head of the elephants, they didn't know it was an elephant. And they just saw this big central hole and they thought it was the evidence that this uh, could be connected to the cyclops, which you know, they thought they really existed in the past. And the middle eye of the cyclop, this is the legend, would, um, would, uh, would have been the central hole, which is in fact the proboscis of the elephants. But I just want you to give this overview just as a general starting point for our discussion today. Let's go to something later. Let's go to the Mesolithic. One of the um, earliest piece of evidence to understand the changes in today's Sicilian coastal landscape is related to early seafaring. And today I want to illustrate you this case from the Egeri Islands, which are located west of Sicily. This is Sicily, these are the Egeri archipelago. And there are three islands, Levanzo, Favignana and Marettimo. Thanks to a uh, throughout investigation um, by Professor Antonioli and his team, uh, it, the, there was a, a great understanding of this portion of the um, of Sicily. Especially the team was able to understand that in the past, around 20,000 um, K uh, dur during the late glacial maximum, the two islands of Levant and Marettimo and Favignana were once connected to the mainland of Sicily. Whereas Marettimo was always isolated, was always an island. In fact, if you can read this, um, this underwater map, uh, you can see that this was the continental platform Marettimo. This was what the continental platform of the other two islands. And there was this channel. It always existed between these two portions of, of land that once existed. Well, the evidence presented in, uh, in, this, in this very recent article, I think 2019, indicates that um, specific evidence, for example, uh, deer tooths and, bo and other bones and mollusks were um, stored and located and found in stratigraphy inside a cave, which um, the evidence indicate that there were human collected, collected by humans and deposited in that cave. Therefore, um, the interpretation that the scholars have about this evidence is that in order for human to travel to Marettimo and be able to eventually create this archeological deposit, they were in fact able to navigate this portion of land, which is um, estimated to be 1.8 kilometer long. And if you think that this is evidence is connected to uh, the Mesolithic, this is most likely is they suggest this might be one of the earliest evidence of seafaring, which is known to have started to, to, to have established it in, during the Neolithic. And uh, this is an incredible evidence. Of course, additional study has to, will, will be done, but um, it's really exciting to know that thanks to the understanding of this underwater morphology is now be able to, we now be able to better understand 
see, and pre possibly predate seafaring uh, from Neolithic to Mesolithic. And again, uh, these are just a diachronic evolution of the of this portion of the archipelago, and the top bottom right is an evolution of the of the sea level and sea level change. If we move to more relatively recent times, I'm presenting you some data from the early and middle Bronze Age um, archaeological findings from the Syracuse area. So I'm sure everybody are known, uh, well, you know, known very well about Syracuse, the Greek temples, and I will discuss later another, about another site uh, dated to the Greek period. But to, right now I want to focus on this um, evidence that comes from a specific feature, a specific a cultural feature for the early and middle Bronze Age, which is related to the Tapsus Pantalica culture, which is very well known for two main cultural features, two, the two, well, two of the most important cultural features. One are these uh, rock cutting tombs uh, that are chamber tombs that were cut inside the, the natural rock and um, these beautiful vases, was uh, shapes are specifically um, related to this uh, culture. And there are two sites located north and south of Syracuse I would like to talk to you today. The Magnisi Peninsula site and the Onina site. So this is a terrestrial example of one of those burials, the rock, the rock cutting burials here and here. But uh, thanks to the study of um, Shikitano and uh, his team, it was also it, it was possible to study and understand that these features on the current shoreline are also uh, rock cut necropolis uh, tombs related to the same period of time, and it is extraordinary for several reasons. The two most important reasons is that the the sacred landscape, the sacred necropolis landscape or ritual landscape that was once believed to be only limited to a specific portion of the Syracuse interland is now extended to a much broader portion. And if we think that nowadays there are circa 5,000 rock cut rock, uh, rock cutted tombs known uh, by studying this evidence from the today's coastal landscape, we might find that there might be more and more. Second, this evidence, and this is just a photograph of a submerged chamber or one of those two tombs, um, indicate that these are extremely important markers to understand shoreline evolution, sea level changes, and coastal changes. In fact, thanks to the study of Shikitano, um, the team was able to map the underwater seabed, and it is a multi beam, um, an acoustic image of the seabed and we're able to detect the different changes in the shoreline over time. This is extremely interesting because not all the um, Bronze Age sites can be better framed in their original landscape, but also later sites located in the close by shoreline. And I'll give you an example. This is the early Neolithic Age shoreline. And this is the, the location of the settlement. However, in the early mid Bronze Age, water was much more present in the area and the shoreline was completely different. So if we think about early and early middle Bronze Age landscape, it was completely different than the one of the Neolithic people. So when we think about the, the shoreline evolution, but also we think about how that means in terms of cultural interaction. We see that the importance of this interdisciplinary study is, is critical for better to better understand the coastal landscape and the societies and cultures in the past and interaction too. And when we go to a later time, the early the Byzantine Basilica that's also been found, it is completely disconnected or almost disconnected by the mainland. Therefore, a completely different scenario, a completely different landscape. And it is really, really interesting. And uh, I forgot to mention that the storms uh, of the early middle Bronze Age are now located between one and three meters of depth.
I will now like to move to one of the, my favorite places in Sicily. Uh, not only because I uh, come originally from Messina, from these islands, but also because I was very lucky that I was part of an interdisciplinary research team who worked in Lipari for so many, for so many years. So Lipari is one of the island of the one of the seven islands of the volcanic archipelago of the Aeolian Islands, and um, is very well known because it's been continuously inhabited since the Neolithic. And as you can see this image from the Acropolis, well, today's Castello, once Greek Acropolis and once uh, Neolithic, uh, Neolithic and Bronze Age site, clearly represents this diachronic and overlapping stratigraphic evolution. And again, Lipari was very critical in the export of obsidian during the Neolithic time. And um, it's very well known for other um, Greek and Roman uh, evidence, it was one of the crucial network for the trade and navigation in the entire Mediterranean. And this image here on the bottom right uh, represents a diver. So we did one of the very recent findings uh, of the, um, in 2014, I think, this is one a base of a clay uh, Lotharian, which has been found very close to the Capistello shipwreck but extremely interesting news. But today I want to talk about a specific site which um, I was very lucky that I personally work on this site and it's called the so-called Pignataro di Fuori Shipwreck. And I published a book um, which is in Italian about this site. The books collect more than 50 years of research uh, about the specific settlement which is located in this portion of the, of the island of Lipari. This is called Monte Rosa, this is the Pignataro, Marina Lunga Bay and the Acropolis and the, the citadel, the main city. So the, uh, the site is a, um, an assemblage of Bronze Age pottery, early Bronze Age pottery. And you can see here's a, a, a representation of these shapes, which are typical for a specific culture in the Olive Islands, which called the Capo Graziano culture. The Capo Graziano culture takes its name by um, a settlement in Filicudi, one of the seven islands of the Aeolian Archipelago. It's dated to the early Bronze Age. And as you can see here, yeah, this is one of the uh, cups that were found in 2019 in Filicudi. Uh, I was also very lucky that I collaborated to the excavation of these um, settlements, which is called Filo Braccio and represent one of the earliest representation of a human figure uh, connected with navigation. Those are ships and in, in a turbulent sea. Anyway, the evidence that was found in this specific site in Lipari, Pignataro di Fuori, has been considered to be evidence of a shipwreck, even though no um, evidence of the ship were ever found. But if you think about, okay, this is a shipwreck from the early Bronze Age, so maybe it's, it's going to be very hard to find evidence of the of the of the hull or the vessel, the ship itself. So everyone in the literature always considered this a shipwreck. However, and sorry, this is a collection of images. Actually, I'm very grateful that I was able to locate these images. Um, because they, they, they describe when the shipwreck was discovered in 1975 and later excavated. And this was one of the earliest endeavors of underwater archeological excavation at the compression excavation. And as you can see, uh, just a collection of nice images. I, I, I always love to share images of happy people diving. I am an underwater archeologist myself, so I am very affectionate. I always like to, to show, especially old photographs. So now uh, it's possible to see the different diving gear. I, I always enjoyed it. And interesting enough, I don't know if you can see this detail on this top right images, there is a diver here, which is smoking a cigarette close to um, a submarine, which is something you don't see uh, nowadays. And I just want to mention that this very large research vessel was at the same time working in the Capistello shipwreck, um, a 5th, 4th century BC shipwreck located in, Greek shipwreck located in Capistello. 
And the team was able to use the submarines for a few days in order to search this, um, to investigate this, uh, this site, which was, by the way, fully excavated. And this is an image of one diver handling uh, some Bronze Age pottery to another diver during the decompression uh, time. So together with uh, um, a collaboration, and especially thanks to um, a study by Professor Sebastiano Tuza in 2009, he, he came across to uh, a collection of evidence from different period of times, and he continued with the Superintendent del Mare investigation in this portion of the seabed, and discovered that there, had, there were additional fragments of the dated to the early Bronze Age located far away from the main location of this uh, shipwreck, which is the one that I'm indicating here, this gray spot here. So a great degree of, uh, um, a great variety and great degree of uh, archeological materials were found. And um, they, look, they, they were found between a depth of 25 and 35 slash 40 meters. Therefore, um, Professor Tusa had the, the idea and the, the hypothesis that maybe this might not be a shipwreck, but might be instead an underwater site, meaning an a portions of an underwater settlement that slid, slid or fall into the sea, in the sea over a different period of time. I was very lucky that uh, I followed up on his intuition and I conducted our broadly research, putting together different sources of pieces of evidence from different fields I worked on the ancient photographs, um, uh, historical maps, uh, a great variety of archaeological evidence, and very new investigation done by uh, Superintendent Del Mar in collaboration with GUE, a group of divers, uh, technical divers. And I collected all this information, and I also worked especially with a team of uh, geologists from uh, CNR and from the Institute of Geophysics and Volcanic. Um, uh, studies and uh, from Professor um, Marco Anzidei, Professor Daniele Casalbore, uh, Alessandro Bosman. They were all part of this team trying to find supporting evidence of this possibility. This can be this a shipwreck? Can, it, can this be instead a, a settlement which uh, sank under water over a period of time? If it, if, if, it, if it was a settlement, it could have been shaped like the standard settlement that we found for the same period of time. And this is an example from um, uh, Filicudi. And this is how it would have looked like. So geological research support archaeological evidence, meaning that it is likely, it is very likely that this might be, um, that, that, that the Pignataro di Fuori shipwreck might be instead uh, the remains of what was a settlement that once and um, slid or sunk in the water. And supporting evidence comes from geology, geomorphology, and the study of the shoreline and the evolution of the shoreline. And uh, it, is, it has been proved that this was once a much larger portion of, of land, of shoreline, and possibly all of these shaded orange, yellow, and gray were uh, were already seabed, and this was the ancient shoreline of the um, early Bronze Age. Of course, additional investigation has to be carried in order to support, with additional archaeological evidence, uh, the full picture. I want to move to another side now, jumping to another side, uh, because I want to, the objective of my talk today is to show the great variety and the great uh, and the different type of approach and studies. And I hope I can, I can do that by providing additional evidence from different period of times. So now we are in Syracuse. You know, I've already discussed about Syracuse, but this is uh, a, more, a much later evidence from the sixth and the fifth century BC. And this specific evidence is related to uh, ship sheds. So, as you know, the Syracuse is currently inhabited and you can see heavily urbanized, but um, 
the, the coastal landscape of Syracuse was much different in the past. And we have substantial research that, that proves us and suggests and indicate the, the, the major changes were especially related to the coastal landscape were happening in these portions and this portion. And it's very hard to, to, to have a complete, a complete understanding of the coastal landscape, especially in a urbanized site, because the only, it's like you have like um, uh, a puzzle and then you have each single piece of the puzzle uh, once there is an archaeological, once there is, like, for example, a development project, and then they have to dig in order to, for example, put the foundation of a buildings. Then there is a glimpse of what was uh, the city looking in the past. And so collecting all those pieces of the puzzle uh, for diachronically help us understand how was Saragos in the past. And over time, as, you, as we know from the Greek period to the Athenian expedition, to a later period of time, to uh, the Roman times, the city had different um, settings. But when it comes to the underwater, to the archaeological um, evidence, this evidence doesn't come from the underwater environment. It's a full terrestrial evidence, which is directly connected to maritime um, topic. And there, I'm talking about two. Um, uh, two areas where uh, sh evidence of ship shipsheds were found. One comes from the top of the small arbor, the Lachius, one comes from the bottom. And as you can see, shipsheds, and I just want to show you this great representation, a 3D reconstruction of how shipshed would have looked like. And I'm sure everybody is familiar, they are um, used for housing and repairing ancient ships, and they are great. Um, marker for sea level change, because in order for them to function, they have to be located very close to the shoreline. And most of the times on a slope in order to facilitate the boat to go in the water, but that, that can be also artificially made. So sh the archaeological evidence of ship, of ship sheds consists on parallel, parallel walls with doors and connections and uh, it is extremely uh, just just amazing to see that, for example, in this image, uh, they were able to interpret interpret this as ship sheds because of these very little portion of parallel walls. And this is an evidence found, as I said, from a parking lot, I think, and then those are just buildings and and cars. So it's an active um, active city living in this uh, living and knowing more about Syracuse thanks to, see, to this evidence is, is really great. And I wanted to show this just because again the great variety is connected to this type of evidence. I want to go very quickly to another site um, which is Naxos located uh, in the Messina province and I'm sure if you've ever been in Sicily, you most likely have been in Taormina and uh, visited the theater or the theater, and this is the Naxos Bay. And again, this is top right is Naxos Bay. Really an amazing place to see. Great ice cream, great gelato. I strongly recommend you to visit. But when it comes to archaeological evidence, again, one of the critical archaeological evidence for shoreline changes and um, understanding the coastal landscape are also ship sheds which were located in north to the Agora. And by a study and uh, many years of research by Costanza Lentini. And this was a, the evidence where um, allowed us to, to, see, to detect the ancient shoreline, which is now located several hundred meters inland than today's shoreline. Amazing, amazing discovery that helps understand that even for example, for planning, uh, when they, they built these buildings here, which are resorts, hotel, et cetera, they, they, were, they built those not on top of the ancient city. They built those because if this was the shoreline, they would possibly build those on um, ancient arbor facilities, maybe, but not on the ancient cities. And so this evidence helped the archeologists understand the urban topography about Nexus, which is an, an extraordinary data to understand uh, the, the evolution of a city itself. And I want to go back to the last case or two that I would like to discuss today. 
And this is Lipari. I'm just going back to Lipari for another uh, case, which is dated to the first fourth century AD and is located in today's commercial arbor. I also want to talk about this because Natalia was personally involved in this project, but also because it is one of the most extraordinary examples of uh, um, interdisciplinary work um, and help us understand uh, sea level change, climate change, resilience, and uh, future coastal changes in Sicily, in Liberty. So this is um, the location of this site, which is currently between uh, 10 to 12 meters underwater, located right in the middle of the commercial and touristic harbor. So I did that underwater excavation here. It was not easy. The Coast Guard helped us a lot to, to help with a with a current uh, ongoing uh, boat traffic, which couldn't couldn't stop. And this site was discovered by accident. At the time I was in Lipari with Professor Tusa, just after a conference, we were just heading towards the, the Alice Scafo, the, the ferry boat. And we will see this big dredge pulling things out of the bed, of the seabed. And among those, there were these gigantic blocks, carved blocks. So we decided, of course, Professor Tusa decided to block the activities and investigate it further. And the amazing discovery was that these blocks belong to a group of other blocks located on the seabed. Of course, there was a great discovery because they were in situ, in place, and they were, this, this block, as you can see from the dimension of the diver, is a, as a square block, 1.20 by 1.20 um, meters, and looks like to be a base or a column, or possibly a capital. Anyway, this was such an extraordinary research and discovery that the team uh, immediately thought, oh, this is just an incredible building, it's for sure it's going to be a temple, because some of these, um, it was located, these blocks were located on steps, and those steps were made out of marble, so really an amazing discovery. However, the investigation continued and we did several archaeological campaigns later in 2013-14 and also 2012. And uh, I think this is with the yellow fins, I, I guess it might be me. And um, yes, the archaeological investigation was conducted as a field school and we discovered that this block was not alone. There were a series of other blocks located in a very com com convulsed way. Some were upside down, some were one against the other. And the site looked like a very confused site, to be honest with you, I have to admit it. Especially because it was fully covered by this one point half uh, thickness uh, of full sediment, sediment uh, including ceramic. And it was just a massive stratification. So the investigation continued. We analyzed pottery and evidence from this site, which includes a great variety of um, uh, evidence, including marble pieces, um, a portion of, of pavement, amphoras, and a different portion of amphorans. And the interpretation that was given, uh, thanks to also the investigation, the help for the uh, geolo geologists and geomorphologists, was that this um, these blocks were part of a massive land reclamation, were a part of a massive action uh, done by the inhabitant of Lipari between uh, um, in, in, in the Roman times. So the, the, the Sardegui itself include a great variety of, of ceramic dated between the second and the fourth century BC, uh, uh, eight, sorry, AD. And it was interpreted like the people of Lipari had the need to uh, landfill all this portion of coast because the sea was actually entering in their houses. And how do we know that? Because of geophysics and geological studies tell us that there is a substantial uh, subsidence of the site. The land subsided, land sunk over a period of time. And this is the reason why this site is now located at uh, 12 meters underwater. 
And the, the need for the inhabitants of Liberty was that they had this massive water entering the, from the ocean, entering their houses, and they need to block somehow. So they sort of created a sort of barrier in order to avoid additional water to enter and to destroy the, um, uh, the waterfront. And we know that also because we investigated um, uh, current uh, buildings and the different of those buildings and the height of those buildings and how from historical photographs we can compare that those buildings in the last 50 years actually sunk. And this is just one of the sample of uh, one of the ferry boats arriving in Lipari in the 1950s. And as you can see, all of these people are trying to avoid this portion of the dock, which is currently inundated by the seawater, which is at the same level of the, of the, of the current dock. Long story short, all of this information was put together by uh, Mark Anzidei and his team and uh, thanks to the um, interpretation of the archaeological evidence, we are now able to better understand how these things process in the future. Nowadays, Lipari is, has a, as a, today still has a big trouble with water from the ocean inundating the city. And uh, the geomorphological investigation suggests that unfortunately, by in the next 80 years, so by, um, uh, by the, the year 2100, between 12,500 and 17,500 square meters of the coast of Liberty will be permanently flooded. So all of these portions of the Liberty shoreline will be not accessible anymore. So I strongly encourage you, if you want to visit Liberty, do it sooner than later but also this is a critical um, tool for uh, today's uh, people, municipality and global governor, government to, to better understand how coastal change uh, on, over time and what to expect in the near future. I have two more cases. I'm gonna go very briefly before I conclude my presentation today. And uh, one is from Cefalu, which is a city located from uh, near, near Palermo, and is very well known because it's heritage listed for the cathedral. And there are, it's, it's a beautiful coastal town in Sicily. And one evidence comes from the, an submerged dock structure, which um, is this for, is the, um, it has been found around nine meters underwater. And it features the standard uh, Roman construction uh, casse form uh, or formwork structure. One of the very few evidence of Caseform uh, cost for uh, work, work form um, in Sicily. And this one representation of how it should have looked like. And again, this is another marker for a later, later period of time about the coastal change and, and how about this specific portion of the shore changed over time. And I want to conclude with the last, last example from the Roman Villa of Durueli, which is located in southern Sicily, close to Shaka. And uh, the villa is dated between the 2nd and 7th century AD, currently investigated by a team uh, led by Professor David Atanasi, University of South Florida. And it is one of the greatest places where to locate a, a villa, a Roman villa, I have to admit. Uh, I am from, um, I, I currently live in Los Angeles, California, and this can be compared to like Malibu Villas, like amazing location close to the shoreline, beautiful uh, mosaics and, uh, and marble um, floors. One of the most, the, the evidence that I would like to discuss with you today is this is a map of the villa and this is a massive wall several meters in height and long that has not, been, has not been connected to a specific room or feature of the villa and has been instead interpreted as a massive sea wall to protect water from the ocean entering in the villa. And of course, this is a river and this is today's shoreline, but it was not like this in the past because as everybody knows, the river brings sediments. There was a, um, a coastal, um, uh, the cost increased in size of a few hundred meters. And we have to imagine that the cost in the shoreline was much closer to the villa and therefore they needed to protect the villa. 
And this was the last example today. But again, there are many more examples in Sicily. For example, the submerged uh, road in Mozia, a wharf in, in Basiluzzo, which has been dated into the first century BC, or submerged, um, uh, submerged millstones caves in Capo d'Orlando near Messina, which are located here, or the very famous Banchina Mento Orsi in Megara Iblea, which is an underwater dock, of the, the very famous evidence from Selinunte, uh, also the dock, uh, dock, dock features. So I hope that today I was able to provide you with an overview of the different evidence from the submerged cities. And I want to finish today with um, a quote from a Sicilian writer who is Gesualdo Buffalino. And I want to show you this quote and I want to read it with you because um, when we look at Sicily, we see this great variety, this great difference. And we also think about the different cultures, the different identities and how all of this connects. And I think this quote from Gesualdo Buffalino is very interesting. And I want to read it with you today. There is a stupid Sicily that is so meek that it sounds silly. A Sicily that is smart. Sorry, a Sicily, a sly Sicily that is smart, committed to violence and fraud. There is a lazy Sicily and a frantic one. A Sicily that exhausts itself by the anguish of the land. A Sicily that performs life as if it were a carnival. Finally, there is one that leans over a windy cliff, overcome by a days of delirium. There are many Sicilies, why? Because Sicily had the fortune of, to exist throughout the centuries as a link between the great Western cultures and the temptation of the desert and the sun, between reason and magic, between turbulent emotions and heat waves of passion. Sicily is suffering from an excess of identity and I don't know whether that might be a good or a bad thing. Thank you.